Hello, my name is Ashley Emerson, and you're listening to Mary Bowser's Every Opportunity to Rise podcast. We're focused on creating more opportunity and making sure all of our residents know about that opportunity. Everybody, from Ward 8 to Ward 1, from advanced degrees to no degrees, from five generations to five minutes, has a fair shot. And welcome back to Mayor Bowser's Every Opportunity to Rise podcast. My name is Ashley Emerson, and I'm the director of the Mayor's Office on African American Affairs. I'm so excited to continue this discussion on housing and the programs and resources available in the district for all Washingtonians. I encourage you to join the conversation by using hashtag EOTRPODDC or email us at E-O-T-R-Pod at dc.gov. All right, so let's get into it. Today I'm joined by Room B Mafuka, a Ward 8 resident. Yes? Yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, two years now. Okay, for two years. Congratulations. Thank and you. Welcome to the district. Thank you. And I am also joined by Yolanda McCutcheon. Yes. And where are you from? What agency are you from? I am the Director of Public Relations at the D.C. Housing Finance Agency and also a Ward 8 resident, almost a year as a Ward 8 resident. Oh, congratulations. Ward 8 in the house. Which which neighborhood are you in? Congress Heights. Congress Heights. I'm also in Congress Heights. Okay. We might be neighbors. Congress Heights on the rise. All right. Um, So we we just really want to get into the different programs on um, at your agency, but on housing. Mm -hmm. and. Your experience in housing, um, working with the different agencies, some of the financing options, how was it mentally, how was it physically, financially, (laughs) all of those good things to get you started on being a homeowner in D.C. Yeah, so when I first started looking for a home or to buy a home in D.C., it was actually at the urging of a good friend of mine. So she had purchased a home about a year and a half earlier. We had worked together at a government agency, and I remember thinking, well, if she can afford a home, maybe I can afford a home, but I I didn't really know where to start. So I used a lot of the same resources that she did. We used the same lender because she had a good experience, and that lender knew about every single program available in D.C. Okay. But up until that point, I, I thought that maybe my income was too high or, you know, I wouldn't qualify because my friend had a child. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm in this weird middle place where I make too much, but not enough to do it on my own. Um, but this lender, Alex Jaffe, he's one of the like foremost D.C. Open Doors kind of lenders. And he helped me understand what I could qualify for. And that just opened my eyes to all the possibilities in D.C. I I was starting to feel that I was being priced out as a renter. And I was having to move further and further out from where I wanted to live. But once I saw how much I did qualify for and then through D.C. open doors that I could get 3% towards my down payment, I realized there were actually a lot of places that yeah. I could afford to buy in That's D.C. That's a real boost, right? Mm-hmm, definitely. So he was great in walking me through the process. Um, One tip that I would give to homeowners is go to as many open houses as you can. It's not something that I enjoyed, but my friend really enjoyed it. So she really encouraged me to go to open houses above my, you know, qualifications below what I qualified for just to really get a sense of all of the different neighborhoods. And you can make a day out of it. Exactly. You can make a day out of it. We would go to lunch. We would, you know, see friends. And and we just discovered new places in D.C. that we had never seen before, you know, really visited before. And it gave you gave me a sense of what I liked, what I didn't like, what I really wanted in a neighborhood. Um, And the other tip that I would have is find someone who has gone through the process because that is your best referral. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where I would have started if I didn't have her to give me a recommendation for a lender or for her to say, hey, I made this mistake in closing. Don't make that same mistake that I did. Um, I think it would have felt really daunting without having someone who just went through it. So what is one of those mistakes that you kind of stayed away from? Um, I can't say that I stayed away from it. Uh, I think there's still some things about home ownership that you just can't plan for. Um, I think one one mistake, it, pretty minor, that I made is that I didn't get the paint color before closing. 
<laughs> of the walls. And I know that seems silly, but two years later, when you're trying to touch up and you're trying to get a hold of the the contractor, you're not going to find them. They've, they've just moved on and they may not even have their paint color. And it's something that we talked about, but they didn't give it to me before closing. So it's impossible to match paint. I'll just say that. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. What are some of the mistakes that you see at the agency um, that residents make or that we help prevent? A lot of it goes back to what Rumbi said. She felt like she was in this middle place where she made too much for some of the lower income band programs, but didn't really feel like there was some place where she could find assistance, but also didn't have the savings on her own to purchase. Mm -hmm. And that's DC Open Doors a sweet spot. We're addressing those people that have great um, credit scores. They have good jobs. They have a good track record. They're interested in buying in the district, but because of the lack of savings for a down payment, which is a lot of the times the biggest hurdle. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of the times people sort of count themselves out before they do the research into these programs. And DC Open Doors fills yes. that gap. I hear that a lot. And I just mm -hmm. want to stop there for a second because sometimes we just, we X ourselves out of opportunity before we even find more information and opportunities, um, information about the opportunity. So that's, that's something I want our listeners to know. If your too, income is too high, you think it's too low, you think, you know, you may not have options, my credit might not be that good, just try. Just go and try, start the process because you never know what amazing DC government program that we have to help support you. Exactly. So for instance, DC Open Doors, um, recently we increased the maximum income level to 145, 600. Oh, wow. Um, so it's always been in the $100,000 range and it's increased steadily as the median income in the city has increased. And although looking at those numbers, people go, wow, someone making that amount of money doesn't need a program, but you have expensive rent. That's as you not said, true. Yeah, right? we know rent that. is expensive. Um, there are student lots of people loans. with student loans. <laughs> These are the top things that we hear when people are coming into our home buyer seminars, um, which is also a great resource to find out about the program, get questions answered from lenders and realtors and our program staff that um, they're there at the agency. And the seminars happen twice every month on the first okay. and third Wednesdays. But that's a great starting point to do that research and see where you fall. Um, the program can also be combined with other programs that are available through the city. Um, so if all of your numbers line up and you qualify for HPAP and Open Doors, you can combine the two and use HPAP for your down payment assistance and Open Doors for your closing cost assistance. Did you hear that, residents? You can combine. <laughs> that's amazing. HPAP and DC Open and Doors. And DC Open Doors. So open and closing doors. Exactly. All right. I'm exactly. Okay. So we have some of the pitfalls you've seen. Um, where, where are some of the resources or where can they find more information about the programs? So DC Open Doors is on social media at DC Open Doors on Twitter, DC Open Doors on Facebook, and then also DC HFA, the housing finance agency of which DC Open Doors is one of its programs is also on Instagram. So all of the information are shared there. The rates for DC Open Doors is five loan products are shared daily um, via social media. So you can get a sense of wh what the rates are and where they fall. And once you meet with your lender, you can determine which rate product is best for you based on where you're trying to buy, the sales price of the home, your credit, your other resources. You can determine all of that information. We do registration for the seminars via Eventbrite. Okay. Um, so they're always um, posted. And then also on DCHFA's website, dchfa.org, we have an events calendar. So there's seminars that take place in-house, but our lenders who are sort of like the primary, the primary port of contact for the program, because they determine which loan product is best suited for you. We have the list of DC Open Doors approved lenders also on dchfa.org. And within that events calendars, our lenders hold seminars throughout the month and throughout the city because there are only two that happen at the agency. But if you live in Navy Yard, you may not be able to make it over to the U Street area by 6 p.m. Mm -hmm. So there might be a lender the that's, options. yeah, there are options. There might be a lender that's holding a seminar offsite, but you'll receive the same information as if you attended one on site. Thank you for that. 
I was going to switch back over to you, Ruby. In terms of having a relationship with your lender, can mm-hmm. you speak to that and how important that is? Yeah, it was it was really important. So I appreciated the referral that I got from my friend because she told me she had a great experience. And normally I'm the kind of person that wants to meet someone in person. So mm-hmm. especially for such a big um a purchase. big event, a very <laughs> big purchase. I So I wanted to meet him in person. His office was in Silver Spring. And it was really difficult for me to get there <laughs> during office hours. So we started the conversation online via email and then phone calls. And he was very responsive. His website had a lot of information. So he could point me there or he would fill in gaps via phone and email. And then I started filling out the paperwork. And that was mostly digital or I'd have to fill it out by hand and then scan it and fax it, believe it or not. But um, before I knew it, the process was done and I had never met him in person. But I actually felt really comfortable with the process because he was so responsive and he had a team, I think, of two other people who would okay. be in touch. So you don't get the paper right work the first time necessarily. And, you know, they would send it back and tell me what I needed to do. And so it was t- it was tedious. It's in that is a lot of paperwork and it's a lot of the re- repeated information, but it actually wasn't as difficult as I expected. Once I had the paperwork in and we had the pre-approval, um, that was it. Then it was really up to me to find the home that I wanted to purchase. And in terms of your pre-approval, what was Mm -hmm. that process like? And what were, what are some of the steps that you need to have in place to get that official letter that says you're pre-approved. Yeah. So I I think the process goes as fast as, as, um, as you can get the information back to your lender. So I, I had, um, my pay stubs ready, um, you know, proof of employment. Um, is there uh, a number of years that you have to be employed? Um, I'm not sure. I, I don't, I don't remember. Um, but, um, for me, I think it was two two years of income taxes, income tax returns, um, as well as yeah, your employment history, your pay, your recent pay stubs to you know proof of income, and the, so the pre approval process actually went really quickly, and I was approved for a lot more <laughs> than I expected. And I actually told him, I said, I'm not buying a home for that much money. I'll be house poor. But uh, but it was <laughs> That's a, a real thing. It's a real thing, right? <laughs> but it was a good surprise because then I thought, okay, I do have you know, many more possibilities than I had thought, you know, going into the process initially. So let's talk about house poor just a little bit. <laughs> <Yeah>. Because, <laughs> you know, so it's like getting a big credit card. Yeah, and we they can talk you- about the mental state of home <laughs> purchasing. Yeah, we haven't gotten to that yet. <laughs> it's a process. And it, I mean, your lifestyle changes, you make um, just tremendous, it's a tremendous investment. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes you may be approved for more that Mm -hmm. you can, your lifestyle can afford. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to navigate that piece. So can you talk about, you know, what that transition was like? Yeah, absolutely. So I'll I'll go back a little bit because another thing that encouraged me to look into home ownership was earlier in 2016 before 2017, before I purchased, there was an NPR story about home ownership. And one thing the realtor said at the end that really stuck with me is in a city like D.C. or other major cities where you know, home prices are going up and people are finding it very expensive to buy a home, she said, you have to think of home ownership like your career. It's a ladder. It's mm-hmm. not like you know my parents who lived in the same home for 40 years. That, they bought it and then that was it. In a market like this, your first home might not be your forever home. You want it to be comfortable. You want it to be something you can afford. But if you want that multi-million dollar home in Northwest DC, you might not get there the first home you buy. You mm-hmm. might have to, you know, buy successive homes to to reach that goal. And that really opened my eyes that, oh, I'm not priced out of the market. Just because my first home isn't going to be my forever home doesn't mean that I can't find something that meets my needs, that's within my budget, that's exactly. in a neighborhood that I like. I can do that now. And so once I changed my mentality about home ownership in that way and, you know, started the process and finished the process, um, I didn't feel compelled to use all the money that I qualified for. So it was kind of a long, a long way around to answer the question. But just because I qualified for more than I had thought, I realized I don't need to use that much because I want my I want to have the 
the disposable income to maybe improve the home that I have, mm -hmm. to maintain it, right? Things are going to come up. I'll need, it's I'll a need cash. Home. Thank I'm you. Right. Yes, it's yes. really beautiful. Thank you with your help. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I, I didn't feel like, oh, I have to buy the most home that I can afford right now because I knew that this home was going to be a step, you know, towards something else. And I just want to say that, I mean, I, I grew up in Ward 7, uh, two generations in Ward 7, and I want to live in Ward 7. It's a choice. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not priced out of wanting to live in Northwest or mm -hmm. wherever. Mm -hmm. There are beautiful homes in Southeast and Ward 7 and Ward 8. Um, so there are options. Mm -hmm. um, okay. I I just want to, if there's anything left for you, like the one thing you want residents to know about. Um, just the one thing and we can, we can end there. One more thing that I'll add is it's important if you can to have resources to help you in your process. And, and even when, and by resources, I mean, in addition to DCHFA and, you know, the, the other programs that exist, um, it's important to have people in your community to support you. So Home ownership is not just the the mortgage. Home ownership is a lot of maintenance and a lot of surprises, like yes. a tree falling in your yard the first year of home ownership. Um, you know, a little water in your basement, and so to have a handyman that's in your neighborhood, to have uh, someone who's cutting your lawn that's that's local, right? That you know that you can depend on. Um, to have friends who've purchased who can give you referrals, all of that has really made the home ownership process a lot easier, uh, more comfortable, or at least I know that I have someone that I can call when things don't go so smoothly. You can always call us too. Exactly. The War Eight Mokers are available <laughs> for you uh, anytime, but I am as well. Any last thing? Um, yes, for DC Open Doors, a lot of people think that it's only limited to first time home buyers, but this program is open to repeat home buyers as well. So again, don't count yourself out before you actually get the information. So if you are upgrading to a second home or you may have owned a home before you moved to the area or you owned a home previously and then you started renting for a couple of years, DC Open Doors is still an option for you, although this isn't your very first time purchasing a home. And also, um, I mentioned that DC Open Doors can be combined with HPAP. It can be combined with other programs too that aren't DC government programs. Oh, okay. And we also currently have closing cost grants of $1,200 and $1,500 based on the median sales price and the median income of the buyer that are currently available. That's great to hear. So I just want to thank you all so much, Rumi and Yolanda, for joining us today and sharing your homeownership story and the plethora of resources that are available. You can learn more about housing programs and resources for district residents by visiting RootsToRoostDC.com. Thanks for listening to the EOTR podcast. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and share this episode. And join us next time as we learn more about programs and resources available in the district. You too can join the conversation by using hashtag EOTRPODDC or email us at EOTRPOD at DC.gov.